So uh, I must start by saying that I'm, I'm, uh, I was not quite an officer in, in the Navy. <laughs> I was a diver though. I'm employed by the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, but I'm working in very close cooperation with the Armed Forces Diving Naval Medicine Center. That's very similar to the um, NIDO being a, a competence center for, for diving and, and uh, aspects of, of, of diving for the Swedish Armed Forces. Here's a picture of our facilities down in the south of Sweden, Koskrona. Uh, you can see uh, our uh, outside diving pool outside it and, and in the back you can see some of our smaller diving vessels there. Here's a picture of our um, actually newly built this year chamber. It's a Hawks chamber and uh, you can see the living chamber in the front there and in the back you see the wet pot uh, which we can open the whole side of and, and then uh, slide in any equipment that you want to test and, and we have a lab fear barrier in there so you can also uh, go in from the into that. We do, of, of course, we do mostly investigations for the Navy and development and, and, and research for the Navy. As Morton earlier said, uh, we are also accredited to some of the tests in the uh, rebreather standard, not all of them though. But if we're talking recreational diving incidents, we're often asked to do the equipment examinations. But in Sweden, and I, I, I must start with saying I think that all these investigations are very dependent on, on, on the local laws of that country or, or that jurisdiction. So, so it's very hard to draw any specific conclusions, but hopefully this, we can at least uh, have a generic uh, discussion information regarding this. In Sweden, the police authorities, when there is a recreational diving incident, the police authorities own the investigation in the sense that they decide when, how, what to investigate. And in doing so, and throughout the whole process, this is confidential and we are just consultants in this investigation. Once the investigation is finished, everything, including all the raw data, is, is me being made public. So, but that's just after the, uh, the incident investigation is, is finished. But the normal procedure is that the body goes to the morgue and the equipment goes to us then at uh, DNC. Here's a picture of our swimming flume. It goes to four knots. It's quite nice to be testing drag and, and stuff and uh, diving equipment. If you look at post-mortem examinations, the absolutely most common cause of death, uh, death is death by drowning. And it's unfortunately, it's not unheard of for the local police to say that if, if the, the medical examiner says it's, it's drowning, then we don't need to do an equipment examination. And that's unfortunate for several reasons. The first one is that this cause of death is, is often made by exclusion rather than, than, than finding specific finds. But the other thing is that it completely disregards the event that led to this drowning. And so that's a, a really problematic situation. And talking of post-mortem examinations, if you compare kind of the difference between open circuit and, and, and rebreather diving is that you've got these three added possible causes, which is hypercapnia, hyperoxia, and hypoxia. And the, those leave absolutely no trace in, in a post-mortem examination. So it's, it's, uh, it's hard to find any evidence of that. That said, the post-mortem examination is, of course, extremely vital because it adds uh, very in kind of this, this whole medical part of the investigation. And we had one uh, example where there was a diver. He, he lost consciousness shortly after leaving the dive vessel and, and lost a mouthpiece and, and drowned. And the first thoughts or the first discussion of the case was that th this was supposed to be a, a thought to be a, a hypercapnic event. The police himself was a bit uneasy with this and that was a good thing and, and he, so he continued the investigation and um, he found this statement by one of the witnesses saying that this, this diver had been uh, quite allergic and 
then he went back to the, the diving vessel and found this wrapper, chocolate paper wrapper, and it contained nuts. So he went back to the medical examiner who, who reopened the case and, and actually did an uh, histamine analysis of the stored blood sample and found, found large amounts of, of histamine. So later on they could uh, ascribe this fatality to, to a, uh, anaphylactic shock. So the post-mortem examination gives those uh, kind of clues and uh, evidences which, which is just impossible to find in the equipment examination. Another thing which is different between open circuit and rebreather diving is that is in carbon monoxide poisoning. When you look at the exposure in carbon monoxide poisoning in, in open circuit, it's it's mainly a a, in a factor of, of the contamination and, and the, the depth. But in rebreathers, it's, it's a completely different picture because the, the human body is such an efficient carbon monoxide scrubber. So every time we breathe that carbon monoxide through our lungs, we will scrub that most of it out. Uh, so it's really hard to determine just from the analysis of, of, of the carbon monoxide content in the, the gas source what the exposure to carbon monoxide was. It depends on if it's in the diluent, how much diluent has been used, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so in that specific case, it's, it's often uh, very good to go to, towards, and, and of course this would, uh, would be done anyway in an open circuit accident, but it, it, it's stronger evidence looking at the carbon monoxide hemoglobin content which the medical examiner can, can find rather than just looking at the contaminations in the hole. So um, that's also an important thing. Here's our indoors pool and some eager uh, recruits there waiting to get in the water. I should start with saying that this list is really, I mean, it depends a lot on what condition the unit comes in. in. So this would be the perfect situation with everything dry and everything working. So it, it, it of course, depends a lot on, on, uh, on uh, the condition of the unit. I started, the, the first point here is downloading logs. And I, I just can't understate that state that enough, the, the, the logs are absolutely vital. It's, it's the most information carrying part of an investigation you, you can find. And it's not only that, it, it also allows you to know what the, the dive profile, and the dive profile gives you evidence for what further tests you should do. So, so the dive, download of the log is, is extremely vital. Then you go on and check the exterior of the unit and do a count along gas sampling. The idea behind that is that you're trying to analyze the, the, the last breath of the diver. Now that's in the theory. In reality, there are so many ways that this could be diluted and diffusion of gases. So, so I wouldn't put my hopes too high on this test, but, but it's simple to perform and, and, and uh, one should, should really do it. Um, uh, and especially if you find a lower than, than surrounding and lower than the uh, diluent oxy tank oxygen fraction in the loop, then you might say that, well, this was probably a low oxygen situation. But on the other hand, you could have oxidation in the loop as well. So, well, after that, you follow up with just looking at the cylinders and analyzing the gas, looking at the valves. And then you do the bigger uh, VOB, CO CO2 challenge, and oxygen consumption tests. We would then dismantle the unit, look through the sensors and electronics and batteries, absorber and, and other items then, and continue. After that, we, we uh, disinfect the unit and assemble it again and do a practical performance, which is basically a dive. And the closer you can do that dive to the actual dive profile, the better. I, I, really like this test because it gives you those subtle things which you don't really find in a in the unmanned testing. You you uh, you can find if there is a a, a slight uh, bubbling in a certain orientation or uh, uh, if the user, which is uh, quite common, has made modifications. You can see that you can really reach everything and. Uh, and it's not only the, the breathing apparatus, of course, it's, it's just the, the complete setup with the weights and everything. So you, you really get a lot of information from a practical performance dive. 
This is our um, breathing and metabolic simulator. It's an Anstey machine that goes to 200 meters. That would be 650 feet. And we use this for, for uh, metabolic testing. It's uh, the principle uh, with this metabolic testing or oxygen consumption testing is that you extract gas from the loop and then of course then you're extracting oxygen from the loop as well. Then you inject inert gas back into the loop and the net effect then is, is consumption or, or removal of oxygen. It's a very nice method and it works really well for us, uh, simple and efficient, in, especially in the steady state situation. When we're looking more at the dynamic portions, we're having some troubles getting the flows right, because you really have to balance these flows. And sometimes when you're testing a closed circuit rebreather, you can have a, a loop volume drift, because there is a, a slight difference between the inlet and the outlet gas flows. So you can get an increasingly smaller, increasingly larger loop volume, which then would affect your testing. For that reason, we have developed our own in-house uh, innovation, which is a we call the metabolic simulator, or short metsim. If you look at this, uh, we've got the breathing simulator up here, and then we're breathing back and forth, and we've got the, the rebreather down here. In the middle there, we have the, we call it the FRC, which is just stolen from the medical people, the functional residual capacity in the middle. We, we draw a gas out from, from the loop with the uh, a blower here, and we add propene gas to that, uh, to the breathing mixture. Here we have a catalytic converter, which then uh, converts that, or combusts that propene gas together with oxygen to carbon monoxide and, and water vapor, which is then uh, uh, blown back into the, the circuit. Since we're not adding any inert gas here, we don't get these problems with, with uh, loop volume drift, and it's, it's a very efficient and good method of, of uh, testing the dynamic portions. We can do really fast ascents and descents uh, with this technique. So it's, it's been a very helpful uh, tool. This whole thing with testing the oxygen consumption, I, I would say that that is one of the really core tests of a, of a rebreather because you're really testing everything together and, and you're really testing if the rebreather is delivering or, or can uh, keep up with the, the oxygen control. So it's a very nice test to, to do. You can look at the calibrations and handsets functions and electronics functions all in, in basically one test. To come up with what to test, I, I, I'd say I, I, the, the rebreather standard is a very uh, good document. I would even go as far as to say I, I think it's good practice to use the rebreather standard. But in an incident investigation, it's of course the dive profile which is the most important. It holds very little information if you test it at 40 meters when the dive was 10 meters and vice versa. So it's really important to remember that, that you're, you're what, the, what you're really testing and this whole kind of knowledge of what you're testing and, and really thinking about that in advance is, is one really important aspect of this. If you look, at what we've got here is, is a, a graph uh, where I've plotted the, the oxygen consumptions versus the respiratory minute volumes that's in the standard. So on the x-axis, uh, we've got the oxygen consumption and on the y-axis, we've got the respiratory minute flows. And each dot here is, is one test in the standard. What you, you can see here is that all of these are on the same straight line. And the relationship between the ventilation and the oxygen consumption is, is, is uh, constant throughout this test. And that is absolutely not a problem when you're testing a, a, a uh, electronically controlled rebreather or a constant mass flow, semi-closed rebreather. But if you're testing a, a machine where this K value here is, is the most important factor, like when you're testing a, a passive or respiratory acute machine, then you really have to know this and you have to know the limitations of that test. If you're just doing the, the standard test, even if you do all these, you're really just testing one condition. 
And is another picture of, of uh, uh, a test with Swedish and Danish naval divers um, on our um, mine clearance dive rig, which is a, a ventilatory keyed machine. And had the K value been the same throughout this, we would have had the same, exactly the same loop oxygen fraction. So that would have been 21. So this is the loop oxygen fraction. And down here we've got the ventilation. Uh, but you can see that these really vary quite, quite extensively. And one quite interesting physiological thing here is that the two lowest points here are the same divers, which are the two highest points here. So in the first dive, they were really retaining, and then we, we were a bit afraid of that, so we told them to try to avoid that. And in the next dive, and these dives are... are um, are uh, 80 minutes long, so there is quite long, and and still they remembered throughout the whole dive to keep their their um, ventilation up high. So so there is a big inter intra individual uh, individual uh, variation in this as well. So, but the basic thing I wanted to, to to point out here is that it's really important to have the knowledge of the test you're performing and why, and what's the the, the background to that test. If we go on to uh, scrubber testing, um, the the standard test is, is, is uh, where you use a breathing machine, so you're pumping gas back and forth, and and, and then you add carbon dioxide to to that um, gas, and then you analyze the uh, carbon dioxide content in the inhalation hose. Doing that uh, is is as as with, with oxygen consumption test, a very good test in testing the whole system, the, the, the integrated parts. But there are there are problems. There are the, the main problems in an, in a post-incident investigations is that you can have both po false positives and false negatives of this test. If, for instance, which is always the, the situation that there is passed considerable time between the testing and the, and the incident, then the solar lamp could have dried out. So you get a more or less immediate uh, breakthrough, even though the, the scrubber was actually working during the instance. You can have the exact opposite situation because carbon dioxide redistributes in the absorber. So you can have the situation that the absorber is more active and, and has the ability to, to uh, absorb more carbon dioxide in the, in the lab than it actually did during the instance. So the other method of testing this is to use a carbonate test. What you do basically is you take a few samples from the, the scrubber and then you dig a bit if, if it's an actual scrubber. You dig a bit down and then you take a few samples more and you dig a bit down and you take a few more samples and then you use a, a thermal gravitometric method. So you heat these samples up to, to uh, 600 to 800 degrees then the carbon dioxide will evaporate and you measure the weight difference. In that way you can, can uh, see how much carbon dioxide was, was taken up by the sample. The problem there is that if you just do that test, you're not doing this whole integrated carbon dioxide testing. So to, to kind of go around these, uh, and, and, and if you're not doing the whole integrated test, it's really easy to miss a, a bypass from a leaking seal or, or a gasket or, or settling. So to kind of get around that problem, what we think is the best thing to do is to start with the CO2 challenge. If the scrubber can take 20 minutes of hard breathing, it was probably working during the instant. If there is an immediate breakthrough, then you then you carefully disassemble the unit, look for, for seals, broken seals and, 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 and uh, gaskets, and you weigh the, the, the content to make sure that there the, was the right amount. And then you do the carbonate test. So we think that's, that's a good uh, kind of middle way. Now if we go on to looking at, at oxygen sensors, if there is a physical problem with the sensor, that, like a broken wiring or something like that, then, then it's, it's fairly easy, of course, to say if the sensor was working or not. But it seldom is. And a blocked sensor surface, if, if it's moisture, for instance, then, then in the lab, the, the, the cell would probably sh show normal values. So, and we actually had that situation 
where, where there was a, a blocked um, a sensor phase, uh, and, and of course the cells were, were perfectly fine in the lab. Uh, but then, through logs, we could could see that this situation had a, had a, a rose. So, um, and uh, and of course you, you have more or less this, the, the opposite situation here as well. Even if you have a sensor which is currently limited or, or, or dead in, in some other or, or has, has a problem in some other way, uh, it still it still doesn't really prove that there was a problem during the dive. So so these are problematic things to to especially when you're trying to find these evidences of, of uh, what, what, what really caused the incident. Here's a picture of our free ascent pool. It's 21 meters deep. Uh, that would be 70 feet. Uh, and as you can see, all Swedish Navy divers have to blow these bubble rings and then dive through them. Otherwise, they're, they're not approved for diving. So looking at loggers, and I've, I've, I've mentioned this a, f a few times now, Hypoxia and hyperoxia is, it's, as I said earlier, it's, it's hard to find in a, a post-mortem, or there is no possibility to find an evidence of that in the post-mortem examination. And it's r extremely hard to find any evidence of that in the physical equipment examination as well. So the logs are, are here extremely vital to, to really find these problems. Um, but the loggers, of course, show other problems as well as, as problems with, in previous dives and or pro other types of problems in the uh, during the dive. One has to remember, though, that it's not the truth that you're seeing in the logs; it's just the sensor readouts. And and when you're looking at the, the, the log files, you have to remember to try to do calibrations afterwards to see see where the sensors are. And, and also remember all these potential problems that the sensor has in, in terms of current limiting and, and, and other aspects. So it's, it's important to remember that when you're, you're uh, looking at the log files. Here is a picture of our outside pool. And uh, you can see uh, one of our uh, divers diving there. Uh, we don't really trust, trust our divers in the Navy, so we like to keep them on a leash. But we, we call it an umbilical just to, to, uh, to not uh, tell them. I've been looking at all the Scandinavian countries' uh, accidents since 2001. It's, it's not an awful lot. It's 10 incidents uh, investigated, and it's 12 divers. If we look at the um, trigger events, which is the events that got this whole snowball rolling, eight out of these 12 were equipment-related problems to some extent, and one was the buoyancy. If we then go forward and look at the disabling agent, which is kind of what, what uh, it, it, it's not the cause of death, but it's, it's, it's uh, what made the, the diver unable to, to recover the situation. It's, Seven of this 12 was inappropriate gas, which is the hyperoxia, hypoxia, and hypercapnia. So, so uh, it's really a large, large part of this. Two were buoyancy issues, and three are uh, unknown. If we look more into detail on these issues uh, and look at the causes, we can see that four out of these 12 incidents uh, were unit in surface mode or, or something similar. Two were lost mouthpiece, two were free, uh, free hand flow adjustment on a semi-closed unit, and one were uh, di diving deeper, deeper than, than uh, maximum operational depth. If we look at the four of 12 units in surface mode, I think that if I would do a recommendation, I would say if those would have been caught if we had, had uh, if the diver would have done a pre-breathe long enough before they jumped in the water. The lost mouthpiece, of course, that's, that's training. Recovering a lost mouthpiece surely must be, be a core part of training. The, 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 the last three there is uh, the freehand <laughs> free flow adjustment and, and deeper than MOD. That, that's semi-closed semi units. And 
I, I do think that if one uses an oxygen meter on these units, it's hard to tell if, if the diver had, had gone deeper than, than the MOD anyway, but I, I think it's, it's at least, at least uh, gives a pointer that something's maybe a bit too much here. So um, I think that's uh, kind of uh, what you can learn from these. I want to kind of end this with pointing a bit on the limitations of investigations. It's, it's really hard to break through paradigms, and in, in the, this, is, this is an open circuit incident, but in the 1990s in Sweden, the mixed gas diving and overhead penetration was kind of catching on, and the uh, authorities was looking at this with rather a scared eye. I mean, they were kind of afraid of this, and so this incident happens where it's, it's two divers, they're penetrating a wreck and they get separated and lose their orientation uh, in this wreck. And fortunately, both divers do get out and do survive this. Uh, this so, so both survive, but as I said, the, the authorities was looking at this market, so they conducted a, a lot, rather large investigation anyway. And it wasn't the Navy, it was the, the Accident Investigation Board, which is the, the ones who do the aviational accident analysis normally. And if you look at that, they really made an, an incredibly large investigation. But if you look at the conclusions and recommendations in the end, the, the only really kind of hard recommendation was that the divers hadn't separated had they used a body line. And I don't really think that anyone today would say or would recommend the use of a body line in a penetrative wreck dive because of the risk of entanglement. But at the time, it seemed very logical because most of this was governed by, by Navy divers and they always used a, a body line when they dove. So I think it's important to, to remember that accidents investigations are important, but if we're going to create the safe culture, it's, it's more a getting together in the whole community and trying to break through these paradigms of, of, of thought rather than, than just looking at more accident investigations. So that's, thank you for me.